Welcome to Rock Point Church. We are so glad that you've joined us for service today. Before we worship, I want to read from the word in Psalm 18, just as a reminder of God's faithfulness and his power. In verse 30, it says this, God's way is perfect. All the Lord's promises prove true. He is a shield for all who look to him for protection. For who is God except the Lord? Who but our God is a solid rock? God arms me with strength and he makes my way perfect. He makes me as sure-footed as a deer, enabling me to stand on mountain heights. He trains my hands for battle. He strengthens my arm to draw a bow. You have given me your shield of victory. Your right hand supports me. Your help has made me great. You have made a wide path for my feet to keep from slipping. Our God is faithful and his word is true. So would you join us as we fix our eyes and our heart on him today? Let's worship. my hope and my strength on Christ the solid rock I stand on the
Only you are the solid rock. Only in you can we found a solid foundation to build our lives upon. God, there's a lot of things in this world that have proven themselves to be sinking sand. God, only you alone are unchanging and unmoving. And it's on your word and in your love that we can stand the storms of this life. God, would you open our eyes to you right now? May we see your hand moving. May our hearts be open to your word. We love you, we thank you, we praise you. Be glorified. It's in Jesus' mighty name that we pray. Amen. Hey everyone, my name is Peter and welcome to Rock Point. If you're our guest today, we would love to meet you. While you're here with us today, we encourage you to take out your smartphone, open your browser, and type in rockpoint.io. Here you can follow along with the sermon, take notes, keep track of upcoming events, sign up for our first look tours, and more. Speaking of our first look tours, this is a great opportunity for those of you who are new to Rock Point to meet Bill and Carrie personally and experience a guided tour to learn more about what makes Rock Point unique. It also gives you a chance to meet others who are new as well. Sign up online to reserve your spot. Our team has been working hard to provide online resources for you and your families. To keep this ministry going strong, we ask you to continue your financial support. If you currently give online, thank you. We encourage you to stay faithful. If you've never given online, it's simple to do. Just visit rockpoint.io and click on the Give tab to set up your financial gift. That's all of the announcements I have for you today. We are glad you are here with us. Let's take a moment to clear distractions and focus on today's message. Well, hey there, Rock Point out and all over the world. It's good to, well, it's good, I don't see you, but it's good that you see me. But hey, I'm just a, a, a glad to be here. Can't wait till we can all be here together again because it's just been a, a, a crazy world. It's been a crazy year. Matter of fact, it, it, I don't know about you, but I'm getting to the point that, that when things start to happen, I'm just like, well, 2020. You know, my, our life has become like the memes. And, and sometimes you just, how about you, but have you been close to maybe the breaking point at any moment? You're just like, I'm gonna break down here. I'm, I'm gonna break down. Some of you maybe are past it, but with everything going on, I've been just trying to, you know, hang in there and, and you know, trust the Lord. And then just the other night, uh, we're, we're, we're sitting in bed at uh, about midnight and all of a sudden my wife goes, I hear something in the bathroom. And I'm like, I don't hear anything. She goes, I hear something. And I'm like, well, go check it out and just say, I'm listening, Lord. And as she goes in there, she goes to see what's going on. And all of a sudden I hear hollering, bell, 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 come in. I go, in, there's water all on the ground. And I go, what is going on? She goes, the, the, the toilet, it's just spraying water. It, 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 it's leaking. And as I, I, I run in there and I look and I'm like, what's going on? I look over her shoulder and I'm like, well, shut the water off, shut the water off. And she's like, I'm trying. But as she's trying to shut the water, our little water valve, it is like almost impossible to turn. So I'm like, I got to run downstairs. I got to run downstairs and get some pliers. So here we are kind of running around, water spraying out. And, and what had happened was the, 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 the tank on the toilet just cracked. That's what she heard. She heard it crack all at once. Nothing hit it, nothing. Just went crack, and now it's spraying water everywhere. So we're running around like, like, like Jack and Rose on Titanic trying to get out of the ship. And as I'm running around, I, I had to run downstairs. She goes, but what about the water? And I go, just hold the, hold the flusher all the way down. Hold the flusher all the way down. So then I run downstairs. I, I grab the pliers. I get the water off. And then we're sitting here looking and, and, and wondering what just happened. I mean, I have never experienced it. I didn't even know this was possible. And, and I, I know a toilet can break if something hits it, it can do that, but, but it was just nothing. Just out of nowhere, it just cracked and started spraying water everywhere. And then I had all that stress of, of having to get that fixed. And, and I, I have no who, but I needed to get it immediately. I had to go out the next morning because I'm like, I know my wife does not not want to have her toilet in the master bathroom. And as I sat there, just exhausted, tired, I had that moment 
You ever get that moment where you're like, and now this, and now this too. I mean, on any other day, it wouldn't have been the worst thing. I mean, I always hate when stuff like that happens, but on top of everything else, trying to get some sleep, bam, here's another thing. Maybe that's your life right now. Maybe you can relate. Maybe you're at that moment where I, I, I'm, life is breaking me down, and it's breaking me down hardcore. Well, what I want to talk about in this, our last session <laughs> for not done yet is that we've been talking about how we're not done yet because God's not done yet. But today, the big idea I just want to unpackage for a few moments is simply this. God is not done turning breakdowns into breakthroughs. God is not done turning breakdowns into breakthroughs. Meaning when we have those moments, when I'm about to break down, when life is breaking me down, when life seems to be breaking apart and it's breaking me down, and, and I don't know if I can go any further and you're wondering what is going on, God wants to turn that into a breakthrough moment for you and for me. So how are we going to look at this? I, I want to look at a passage in Acts chapter 16. And the story of Acts is the story of the Acts of the Holy Spirit. It's the beginning of the church. And we're in chapter 16, and we're going to look at what happened in the life of a guy named Paul. We looked at him a few weeks ago. And um, Paul now is this missionary God's called him to, to be. He's going all over the, the Roman world, the, the Greek world, the, the outside of, of, of Israel. And he is starting churches. He's going everywhere and just leading people to Jesus and starting churches. And in 16, he has a partner named Silas. And they've gone into a, an area called Philippi. And it starts off great. They're serving God. They're doing what they're supposed to be doing. They're starting this church. They meet a woman named uh, Lydia. They lead her to Jesus. She invites them to her home. And she goes, you can set up shop here and start this church. And it says her whole household comes to know the Lord. And, and that's a good beginning to a church because you think, oh, it's just one woman. But the fact that she had a house and invited them and it was big enough uh, meant she, she had some means. She, this, this woman was, was apparently probably wealthy. And so they have some funding. They have a, a, a place to meet. They don't have to wear masks. It's awesome. And, and when it says the whole household, it wasn't just Lydia and maybe her crazy sister and aunt or whatever. If she had any wealth in this culture, a household included all the people that were at the servants, the, you know, everybody, some extended family, it could be up to 70 people easily in a household. So they start this church. It starts to go well. And now they're going into the city. They're preaching. They're, they're telling people about Jesus every day. Seems to be going well. But as they're walking in, there's a, a, a girl. That's, she's actually a slave that has actually demon-possessed. And this demon allows her to call out and say something that's futurist, like predict the future. And so the, her masters are making money off of her. And Paul walks by, and he finally she starts hollering out stuff, and, and he gets kind of a little bit frustrated, but he says, you know what, i got to do something about this. So he turns, and he casts out the demon. Well, along with the demon goes her gift, and along with that goes the money-making for the masters. They can no longer take advantage and oppress this girl and get rich off of it. Well, they don't like that. So they rally everyone in the town. They get everybody worked up. And that's where I want to pick up the story because it started so well. And remember, Paul and Silas are absolutely serving God 100%. And yet life breaks down on them in this moment. And I want to see what they do because I think we're going to see by how they respond. This is how, this is how uh, you can see God turn a breakdown into a breakthrough. So we're going to start in verse 22. We're going to pick up the story. So the, the, everyone gets mad. And so verse 22 says, a mob quickly formed against Paul and Silas. <laughs> That's funny. This is a, a mob now. That's not good. And the city officials ordered them stripped and beaten with wooden rods. That sounds terrible. They were severely beaten. So not, not just a normal beating. They severely beat them. And then they were thrown into prison. So this mob attacks them. They beat them with rods severely. And then they throw them into prison. But it says the jailer was ordered to make sure they didn't escape. So they're like, you better not let them get out of here. So the jailer put them in the inner dungeon and clamped their feet in stocks. 
the inner dungeon. You got to understand, prisons back then, this is most likely, as we'll see later in the story, it, it's usually a family run business. The prisons are a privately run kind of a thing. And it's usually on the backside of where their home is. So it's near where they live, but it would be this atrocious building of thing that's, you know, the first level dungeon is usually a hole in the ground. The inner dungeon is a deeper hole in the ground. And they are not, they are filthy. There's no running water. There's no ventilation. They're disgusting in the normal part of the prison. The inner part is even lower. Well, if you don't have ventilation, you don't have toilet facilities, you don't have stuff like that. Guess what flows downhill? So they are down in a deep hole. And not only that, they are immobilized. They're put in shackles where they can't even move. So they were serving God. They did something good. And then life turned on them and they ended up in lockdown, basically. They ended up in a horrible, terrible, terrible place. But what do they do? What do they do? Because I think as we look at this, I think we're going to see three things that they do, that we can do, that, that, that allows God to turn our breakdowns into breakthroughs. So here we go. Verse 25. It says, around midnight. So halfway through the night. So now it's in the middle of the night, the darkest part of the night. They're sitting down in this hole for doing the right thing. They've been beaten. They've been deprived. They can't even move. But you know what they can move? They can still move their minds and their mouths. And so look what it says in verse 25. It says, around midnight, Paul and Silas were praying and singing hymns to God. So around midnight, what were they doing? In the middle of this disgusting sewer pit of a hole in the ground, in their beaten bodies, broken down, chained up in the dark, they're praying and they're praising. So that's kind of the, 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 the first two things there, is, is if I want to see God turn a breakdown into breakthrough, I need to pray and I need to praise. The, the first thing, pray. That's the first thing they did. They prayed. You see, this is going to sound so basic and so simple, but it's just like when, when, when I would play a sport and, and you would learn how to hit a baseball. A lot of practice is so boring because it's just simple fundamentals, simple fundamentals. And, and you have to remember the fundamentals. And the fundamental of the faith is the first thing we should do when life starts to break down, when life starts to make sense, not make sense, when, when it gets tough, when the world goes crazy, when my life is kind of shaken up, when I'm like, hey, I thought I was going this direction. I thought I was going the right direction. I thought I was serving God. And all of a sudden, this horrible thing happens to me. The first response should always be prayer. The first response. But that's our struggle, isn't it? I don't know about you, but oftentimes I struggle. I, I don't pray first. Prayer isn't my first response. It becomes my last resort. And it's supposed to be a first response, not a last resort. So you know what we tend to do instead of prayer? Or at least me. I won't, I won't throw you in with me, but maybe you're like me. Um, instead of pray, we panic. Instead of pray, we panic. When I sat there in the tank, bro, the first thing I wanted to do was not say, Lord, Father, thank you that you were God of the universe and you knew this would happen. You need to strengthen me. You need to help me. I don't know what's going on, but give me the strength. No, the first thing I did was panic and ran around and go, you know what? This is going to cost me money. Who am I going to ask to do this? Everyone's busy. Am I going to have to call in a plumber? How many days is it going to take to do that? What's going to, I mean, I started panicking in my head. I was just, I just panicked <clears throat> with everything going on in your life right now. Are you praying? Or are you just panicking? Because the problem with panic is panic just brings worry and doubt. And then that turns into frustration. And, and, and that is so emotionally draining that it basically takes you to a deeper prison. It takes you to an inner, inner dungeon in your own heart, in your own mind. So whatever you're going through, whatever you're facing, could you just stop and start talking to God? Just pray. But along with prayer, they were not only praying, it says they were singing songs, hymns to God. They were praising God. These go hand in hand. They prayed, they were talking to God. Then they were singing about God. They were singing to God. They were praising. So, so, so typically we want to panic instead of pray, 
But also, I think what we tend to do when we don't pray, when we panic, the second thing we tend to do is prattle. In, 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 instead of praising, we prattle. Now, I know you're thinking, what is, did, did I just make up a word? Prattle is a real word, and, and its definition is simply to talk at length in a foolish or inconsequential way. So whenever you start panicking, do you ever notice how you just start prattling on about what do we need, what do we need, what do we need, and, and it's foolish, you're not really trusting the wisdom of God, and it's usually inconsequential. All the prattling and the plans and trying to do things your own way and running around in the panic doesn't really accomplish anything. And half the time, you know what the prattle turns into? It turns into what I call a prattling pity party. At least for me, if I, if I don't pray and I lean into panic, I will then start prattling and my prattling turns into a pity party. Like, I can't believe this tank broke. This is not that old of a toilet. God, why would you let this happen? I am doing what you've asked me to do. We, we built this beautiful new building, the church. You, you built it through us and, and we can't even use it. And I'm, I'm, I gotta record a message on, on video again. And, and, and it's harder and there's all this sickness and there's so many things going on in the world. It, and you know, and I don't even have sports happening right now. And you want to prattle, you want to go. And then my kids, my daughter's going into her senior year, and I don't even know what that's going to look like. And I feel bad that if it gets called messed up and ruined, there's pressure, there's all these things. And what I want to do instead of pray is instead of pray, then I don't praise, I end up prattling. I panic and I prattle. And the prattle usually turns into a pity party. I'm willing to guess I'm not alone in wanting to take that natural road. Where are you at right now? Are you in the middle of a pity party? See, you can either raise a praise or you can prattle in your pity party. And, and, and what I'm saying here is you can worship or you can worry. But you know what's interesting? You rarely can do both at the same time. Worship all through scripture Worshiping God goes to war against worry. It does. It does. Matter of fact, there's, there's a great song we sing. And you know, I, it just might show up at the end of this sermon. We might sing it. Don't know. But it's called Raise a Hallelujah. Raise a Hallelujah. And, and I love some of the words because it actually is, is, is saying exactly what, what it's happening here, what they're doing. When they start to praise God, the worry kind of goes away and, and they're able to handle it. They're able to not just have a, a, a breakdown, they're able to have a breakthrough. And, and I love, I just want to read some of the words. It's called, raise a hallelujah in the presence of my enemies. In the presence of my enemies. So it's saying the time you need to praise God is when you are facing the thing that wants to destroy you. When you are right there, you are right there. It actually goes down in another line. Another one line says, I'm going to sing in the middle of the storm, just like they're singing in the middle of the night. The middle of the storm. Usually, if we're trying to be a good Christian, when the storm starts, then they say, you know what? We're going to fight this fight. We're going to sing. But about the middle, when it's like you're only halfway and you know that I, and you don't even know what the middle is. But by the time you get into the middle of this storm, that's when you want to just be done. But it says, I will do this, sing in the middle of the storm. It says, I will raise a hallelujah in the presence of my enemies. I will raise a hallelujah louder than the unbelief. What's the unbelief? Is it the unbelief of the enemy? No, it's my unbelief. It's my unbelief that when, when the enemy's there, when the problem is there, I need to praise that out sings my unbelief, my struggle, my wanting to break down and give up. The praise empowers me. I raise a hallelujah. I love it. My weapon is a melody. My weapon is a melody. You know what? That sounds crazy, but that's actually true. I mean, think about it. There is a worldly way that we copy this. The way we're wired to love music. Have you ever just gotten mad, upset, frustrated? My daughter does this a lot. When she's really kind of struggling, she goes in and turns on her power ballad music, the, the song she really loves, that just, and she'll just jam to the music but you know with just, and that's a, a cool thing but in a worldly way that only takes you so far when you do that a melody of praise to our Lord that praise then empowers me that's what this song says I love how it says up from the ashes, hope will arise. 
death is defeated, the king is alive. I love down a few more lines. It says, I raise a hallelujah. I will watch the darkness flee. I raise a hallelujah in the middle of the mystery. The mystery means I don't understand why this is happening. I don't understand why God is allowing this to happen. I don't understand in God's plan why it would go this way. Like Just like Paul and Silas, they were doing the right thing. A church got started. It's going the right way. They're being honoring. They're being faithful. They cast out a demon, and now they're in a dungeon. I can relate. I feel like that a lot trying to lead a church. But it's the, I love this word, these words, the, the darkness will flee, and I will raise Ollie in the middle of the ministry. When I don't understand, because when I do that, the next line says, fear, you lost your hold on me. And then it goes on to say, sing a little louder, sing a little louder, sing a little louder. Raise a hallelujah in the presence of your enemies. And I think sometimes our enemy is not so much the problem in front of us. It's what's going on inside of me. I often am my own worst enemy. How about you? Do you need to raise a hallelujah in the presence of your own attitude, in the presence of your own unbelief, in the presence of your own fears, in the presence of your own frustrations, in, in the presence of your own exhaustion? We need to not just pray, we need to praise him. And you know what's true about this is, is, here's what's crazy, praising him when things are going bad is the most incredible important time to praise him because that's true worship that's declaring i know that my circumstances make me not want to believe you god but i'm going to show faith and praise you in the middle of all this because the truth is this if i can't praise god in my pain i will rarely be able to please god in my pleasure if i can't praise him when in my pain then when life is pleasurable, when things are going good, I probably won't choose to please him. I'll forget about him. That's kind of a truth. So, so what we need to do is pray, not panic. We need to praise, not prattle in pity. And the last thing we need to do is point, not pin. What I mean by pin? Pin the blame. See, the, the natural sequence when life starts to break us down is, is we, we panic, we prattle with pity parties, and then we start to look for something to pin the blame onto. God, why did you do that? Why did you allow that? Maybe it's me. We even pin the blame on ourselves. And it's like, I guess I'm a failure. I guess I can't do this. I can't. And sometimes it has nothing to do with any of that. This could be a God-allowed moment. He could be actually putting you in a moment and giving you an opportunity, not an oppression. But we look around and we, we, we try to pin the blame on someone. Matter of fact, we, we, we should point, not pin. But often when we look to pin the blame, we actually do point. We point fingers at people. And particularly one finger is the finger we like to point at people when we get really frustrated. We just get angry and we start fighting with everybody. And the sad thing is we tend to fight the most with the people that are closest to us or anyone on Facebook. That's pretty much the, the, the order of things. But we need to point, but not fingers. We don't point our fingers at people. We need to point people to Jesus. Remember a few weeks when we looked at Paul and he learned that he needed to put mission over myself? This is, those, this, is this moment. He starts doing that. Because as they sit there, let me, let me show you what happens. Show me what happens here. So it says, around midnight, I said that they were singing hymns to God. And listen to this, catch this. Just remember this, it's, it's weird why it even says this. And the other prisoners were listening in verse 25. So they're singing, and all the other prisoners are listening to them. Suddenly, verse 26, there was a massive earthquake, and the prison was shaken to its foundations. All the doors immediately flew open, and the chairs of every chains of every prisoner fell off. So think about it. All of a sudden, this earthquake hits. They're listening to them pray and praise, and then the doors flew open, and their chains even fell off. I mean, think about it. There is nothing holding you back from leaving. 
It's like, you know what? You, you, you can have a breakout. And, and then there's the moment they could go break out of prison. A matter of fact, the jailer woke up in verse 27 to see the prison doors wide open. He assumed the prisoners had escaped. That's probably a pretty good assumption. And it says, so he drew his sword to kill himself. Why would he draw his sword to kill himself? I told you earlier, prisons were usually a private, uh, a private business. But in this culture, that type of business, you could make some money, but you, you basically fail. Failure was fatal. It's like being a soldier often. If you failed, if you let all your prisoners get out, you're going to be held responsible. And, and the truth is you could be put to death and your whole family. So if he kills himself, what he's probably trying to do is I'm going to do this honorable kill myself and then they might leave my family alone. So this guy knows if they all leave, I'm dead. My family might be dead. <clears throat> so think about it. This is the guy that decided you can't get away. I'm not just going to put you in the dungeon. I'm going to put you in the inner, deeper dungeon. And then I'm going to chain you up in this dungeon. So their only experience with this guy is probably not very pleasant. But look what happens. He's about to kill himself. But verse 28, Paul shouted to him, stop, stop, don't kill yourself. And this is the craziest part. We are all here. We're all here. It wasn't just Paul and Silas. None of the prisoners left. They all stayed. They had a chance for their freedom. They could have taken off, but every one of them stayed behind. I can now you can you'll see in a moment. I understand why Paul and Silas would choose to stay because they knew they were on mission. They they knew that they they, they were going to about to have a breakthrough. They didn't have to run for the breakout. But why did everyone else stay? Well, the only thing in this text that seems to indicate why they would do it was the part where it says when they were praying and praising, the other prisoners were listening. That's the only indicator. Something happened to them Why Paul and Silas were praying to God and worshiping God. And so when they chose not to leave, nobody left. And it ended up saving the jailer's life and potentially his family's life. Verse 29, the jailer called for the lights to be ran, uh, for the lights and ran into the dungeon and fell down trembling before Paul and Silas. And here you go. When he brought them out, he asked them, sirs, what must I do to be saved? What must I do to be saved? You know what's interesting? The demon that irritated Paul in the beginning of this story was crying out to the people, don't listen. They're going to tell you how you can be saved by God, which is a, a weird thing for a demon to say. But the demon was probably knowing they would cast out and then they get arrested. It was probably the demon's attempt to stop them from presenting the gospel. But what's so ironic is God used what the demon was saying to actually be prophetic about what he was going to do and how it was going to happen. People were going to get saved because they got cast into prison. Think about that for a little while. Breakthrough. They replied, believe in the Lord, verse 31. Believe in the Lord Jesus and you will be saved, along with everyone in your household. And they shared the word of the Lord with him and with all who lived in his household. Even at that hour of night, the jailer cared for them and washed their wounds he and everyone in his household were immediately baptized. He brought them into his house and set a meal before them. And then he as an entire household rejoiced because they all believed in God. There it is. There it is. You pray, you praise, and you point people to Jesus. You stay on mission. It says all over in scripture that the bad things, our pain, can ultimately, God can turn it to something good. If we trust Jesus, if we love God or called according to his purpose, his purpose is we're supposed to share Jesus with the world. We're supposed to point people to Jesus by loving them like Jesus would. Well, what do you think Paul and Silas did here? And by extension, they got all the other prisoners to stay was, was this idea that this guy was mean to them. This guy had imprisoned them, but yet they were willing to stay imprisoned for him. They pointed him to Jesus because they loved him the way Jesus loved. 
Their pain turned into an opportunity, not an oppression, a moment for God to do a breakthrough, not only in their life, they got to be a part of seeing God doing something amazing, but they got to see the church actually grow. This jailer, his whole family now is, in, is, is a part of this church. Think about that. You put, point people to Jesus by loving them like Jesus, by putting people ahead of yourself. When life is breaking down and breaking you down and you say, hey, I've tried this. I keep praying. I keep worshiping. I'm here watching this, aren't I? But do you finish the third part? Do you use that and continue to point people to Jesus? Do you continue to reach people, to share the gospel or when you're in that inner dungeon are you praying God to God and praising God and waiting for the earthquake to open the door so you can get out see oftentimes I think we want to pray praise and then we want to have a breakout not a breakthrough see a breakout is I'm praising God and praying to God but what I'm really praying and praising him for is I'm hoping he'll just get me out of this situation as quickly as possible. You see, God is the one that sends an earthquake and opens the door. But you realize sometimes when God opens a door, it's not for us to run out. It's for us to run in. It's an opportunity to run into someone's life. It's an opportunity to get involved. It's an opportunity to show love and, and, and to have them be, wow, I can't believe, like this jailer, he's probably like, I can't believe you didn't leave. Why would you care for me like that? How about you? Do you really want to break through? Or are you just wanting a break out? God, get me out of this scenario. Get me past coronavirus. Get me past all the political craziness going on in our world right now. Get me past the pain of, of, of the job issue and, and, or the marriage issue or whatever it is. Is your prayer and praise tied into a breakout instead of looking for the breakthrough? And that breakthrough is to point others to Jesus through what's going on in your life. I mean, I knew that when I sat there with that broken toilet. One of the things that helped me is I finally calmed myself. I prayed. I said, thank you, God, because I've been wrestling over my sermon and, and how am I going to even lead into this? And as I sat there, I laughed. I go, you just helped me prepare my sermon, which is funny because the next day was my sermon study day, and I had to spend the whole morning replacing a toilet tank, which got worse. I ended up having to buy a whole two toilet. So I got an extra part of a toilet but I was ahead of the game God took that moment and allowed it to take the mission he had for me to move forward and you know what's crazy about this is this church in Philippi if you look through the history of how it got started it, it pretty much got started with a wealthy woman a slave girl and a prison guard that almost sounds like the beginning of a joke, doesn't it? A, a rich woman, a slave girl, and a prison guard walk into a bar. It's, it, it really begins like, and it's, it's not a joke. And this church, be, you know, the book of Philippians is to this church. It's a powerful church. And it started with the oddest combination of people ever. And that's how God works. But you know what? Most of those people didn't come to the Lord till after everything started to break down. So how about you? Do you realize that God's not done turning your breakdowns into breakthroughs? If you'll just agree with them, if you will just choose to pray, praise, and point, not panic, prattle, and pin? Where are you at on that? You know, the bottom line of what, what it's really saying we should do here is, is, is back in the 70s when I was a kid, um, 
apparently clothes in the 50s and 60s. By the 70s, they're already changing it. But they had a problem that clothing right now, you don't realize clothing nowadays, kids, is, is, has special stuff in it to make it like flame uh, retardant. It doesn't catch fire as easy. But apparently back in the day, the way they used to make clothes, they would catch fire really easy. So they had this real problem that if you're a kid and you're in a family, if you get stuck and your house is on fire, or you're near fire, there's a really good chance your clothes are gonna go up in flames. And so they started a campaign. And, and some of you on your couch, you already know what it is. It's three words. Say it with me right now. Yell it at the TV screen. Confuse your kids. Make your dog get worried. And it's this. It's stop, drop, and roll. Remember that? Stop, drop, and roll. And it was basically if you find yourself on fire, you just need to remember stop, drop, roll. And that's kind of cool because it's true because they say stop because you know what the first most likely thing to do? And I, I understand if I catch myself on fire and I'm starting to flame out and, 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 and just, you know, burn, my gut reaction is going to want to run around, right? I'm on fire! You know, the problem is when you run around and you're generating that wind, you are literally feeding the flame and making yourself burn even more. So you need to stop. <clears throat> Don't run. Then you need to drop to the ground and then you need to roll back and forth because now you're not feeding the flame, you're putting it out. Stop, drop, roll. That's really what, what this passage is saying. Pray, praise, and point is really you need to stop. Stop, don't panic when life seems like it's on fire. Drop to your knees in prayer and praise of God. And then roll into your life going after the mission he has for you, for me. Be faithful, not fearful. Because when I stop, drop, and roll, when I do that, all the bad stuff that's happening to me stops being a breakdown and God will turn it into a breakthrough. Are you ready for a breakthrough today? Stop, drop, roll. How is your breakdown? Maybe an opportunity right now for a breakthrough. Because if you look at this for this jailer, Paul and Silas's worst day became his best day. How can maybe your worst days be used by God to be best days for someone that needs Jesus. It's that simple. And God's not done wanting to do that through us. Are you ready? Are you ready for a breakthrough? Your worst days can end up being someone's best day. And you know what we, how we should model that? Is, is that's what Jesus that's what Jesus did. He stopped. When, when, when we fell into sin and we were broken and separated from him, guess what he did? He, he, he stopped. He didn't panic. He dropped. He came to this world. And he let his life be rolled out onto a cross. He let himself be broken. He let his life be broken down so we could have a breakthrough. When we do the same, it's when we're the most like Jesus. And the goal that Jesus has for us in this world is to become like stop, drop, roll. I want to pray and then we're going to praise. Would you pray with me? Father God, I thank you. It sounds weird, but I thank you for the tough moments. In them, they're terrible. And Lord, I pray that, that I could get through them for everyone, that we would get through them as quickly as we possibly can, but not without accomplishing what you want through this moment. So Lord, I'm not thanking you for the pain, but I'm thanking you for what you can produce through it. 
So Lord, I pray that you would help me and anyone listening to pray, praise, and point. And Lord, I just want to pray for anyone there that maybe they, they, they can't point others to Jesus because they've never met Jesus. There might be some people listening right now that are the jailer. They're Lydia. They're the slave girl right now. They're oppressed. They don't even know you. And I pray that maybe right now they can put their faith in you. If that's you and you're watching wherever you're at, you can actually do the same thing that this jailer did when he says, what do I do to be saved? Saved just means what I do to have a relationship with God that is an eternal life but gives me power for the present and a hope for the future. It's simply you put your faith in Jesus, as Paul said. You put your faith not in yourself, not in your works, not in your panicking, not in your own plans, not in your own pleasures, but you just simply turn to Jesus and say, Jesus, I have ran far from you. But now I believe that you died on the cross for me. You let your life be broke down so I can have a breakthrough of life. So if you're there and you want to be saved, just pray something like this with me. Just pray, dear Lord Jesus, thank you. Thank you that you let your life be broke down so I can have life. Thank you that you died for me, but you came back to life defeating death. And right now, in the best way I know how, I want to turn from my sin and my brokenness, and I want to put my faith in what you did for me and ask you to forgive me. Thank you. Now help me step out of this moment and get involved in a church, just like this slave girl, this wealthy woman, and this jailer and their whole households did. Help me to be a person that learns to to pray, to praise, and to point others to you. I pray this in the mighty name of Jesus, amen. All right, we've prayed. And now it's time to praise. Are you ready in the middle of your storm to sing a hallelujah? Let's do that right now. church from wherever you're at we are going to praise our God together and we're going to raise a hallelujah come on let's lift it up I raise a hallelujah in the presence of my enemies I raise a hallelujah and louder than the unbelief a hallelujah my weapon is a melody I raise a hallelujah heaven comes to fight for me I'm gonna sing in the middle of the storm Hallelujah With everything inside of me I raise a hallelujah And I will watch the darkness flee I raise a hallelujah A hallelujah. I fear you lost your hold on me. I'm gonna say in the middle of the storm, louder and louder. You're gonna hear my praises roar up from the ashes. Hope will arise. Death is the
right, church. We're going to lift it up. And we're going to sing a little louder. 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 We're gonna sing a little louder. I'm gonna sing a little louder. Sing a little louder. God, we praise you with everything that is inside of us. We praise you in this moment. God, I pray for those right now that are in that difficult circumstance, in the middle of the storm, Lord, and in the middle of the darkness maybe, that your light would break through as they pray and praise and point to, to you, God, I just pray. Lord, that you would be with them, that, Lord, you would just bring your light and your goodness and your grace. That you would help us to be a people who can raise a hallelujah, no matter what we're going through, because of who you are. God, make us like you. We love you. We worship you. Thank you for your goodness and grace. In Jesus' name we pray. Thank you so much for joining us. We love you so much and we cannot wait to see you again. So I pray that you would have a blessed week, a safe week, and we hope to see you soon. God bless you.